Well, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thanks for all uh, to all of you for joining us today. I'm uh, Bill Johnson, and I represent the 6th District of Ohio. As a co-chair of the UXO Demining Caucus, I'm really pleased to welcome you all to today's discussion on U.S. leadership in the Horn of Africa. Our esteemed panel will provide updates on the region and highlight the need for continued demining and weapons security efforts across Somalia, uh, Somaliland, and Ethiopia. Currently, this region is heavily contaminated with landmines, explosive remnants of war, and insecure weapons uh, stockpiles. In Somalia, terrorist groups such as Al-Shabaab have targeted vulnerable stockpiles of weapons and ammunitions and have harvested explosives to conduct attacks. This certainly underscores the importance of continued demining and weapons security work conducted by organizations like the Halo Trust. Having these weapons fall into the wrong hands would certainly have a devastating impact on populations that are already suffering from the remnants of war. In many cases, long after the conflict has already ended. Earlier this year, my caucus co-chair Jackie Spear and I led a letter to the State and Foreign Operations Appropriations Committee requesting increased funding for conventional weapons destruction programs worldwide. I'm very pleased that the Senate included an even higher amount of support in their budget draft, 272 million. And I'm hopeful that this amount will be included in the final budget for demining and weapons security programs for fiscal year 22. In addition to saving lives, these important programs support security and stability in the Horn of Africa, an area of great strategic importance to the United States. I apologize that I won't be able to stay on and hear the presentations that our speakers have for us today. Uh, we've got a, an extremely packed schedule, a lot of activity going on on the floor, uh, but my staff is on the call and they will moderate the discussion and give me a full readout on what our speakers say about the important work being done in the Horn of Africa. And now, let me turn it over to uh, my colleague, Representative Jackie Spear, for her opening remarks and to introduce today's speakers. Thank you to my good friend and colleague, Congressman Johnson, um, for his leadership and for his remarks. Um, I'm delighted to join you as well for the UXO Demining Caucus briefing on the Horn of Africa. Uh, this is a really important briefing today, and we've got some outstanding knowledgeable panelists who are joining us to speak. Uh, my opening comments will be as brief as possible. Um, although Djibouti became the first country in the Horn of Africa to become mine safe in 2004, the region's people have suffered immensely from the scourge of landmines and unexploded ordinances. Somalia, Eritrea, and Ethiopia all have extensive landmine co contamination. In recent years, landmines in UXO have caused over 25,000 casualties in the Horn of Africa. In a horrific incident just last year, a school bus triggered an anti-vehicle mine near the Ethiopian border, killing and maiming children whose only wish was to attend school. Ethiopia is one of only nine countries worldwide classified as having massive levels of UXO contamination, although further surveys are needed to determine the extent. Tragically, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused the temporary suspension of all demining activities in Ethiopia, halting this life-saving and critical work. The ongoing crisis in Ethiopia's, Ethiopia's Tigray region has also limited access to essential humanitarian and rehabilitation services for some of the most vulnerable communities. We know that violent conflict, including UXO contamination has an outsized effect on women and children. I will be introducing a resolution next week condemning the ongoing violence against women and girls in Northern Ethiopia. I welcome um, any on this call who would like to on behalf of their bosses, co-sponsor the legislation. Combatants in the conflict have consistently used sexual violence as a weapon of war. Women and girls are disproportionately impacted by all elements of war, landmines and UXO 
loss of essential services, food insecurity, displacement, and sexual and gender-based violence, to name just a few. This resolution condemns these injustices and implores all parties involved in the Northern Ethiopian conflict to reach a stable ceasefire, hold perpetrators of gender-based violence accountable, and communicate to combatants that this abhorrent violence will not be tolerated. We also urge the United States to support investigation into these crimes against women and girls, provide comprehensive support to survivors, and encourage a coordinated approach to prevention and response to sexual and gender-based violence. So thank you all for joining this important program. With our continued and steadfast efforts, we can and must work towards removing mine contamination and furthering peace and prosperity in the Horn of Africa. It's my pleasure to extend a warm welcome now to our expert panelists, Karen Chandler, Tobias Hewitt, and Jasmine Dan. Tobias Hewitt has worked in the humanitarian sector for the past 13 years in the variety of roles, including the Peace Corps. For the past six years, he's worked for the Halo Trust in Cambodia, Nagorno-Karabakh, the Ukraine, and most recently as the program manager of Halo in Somaliland. He holds a bachelor's degree from the University of California, Santa Cruz, yay UC, and a master's in international development from the University of Edinburgh. Karen Chandler, the director of the Office of Weapons Removal and Abatement Bureau of Political Military Affairs at the U.S. Department of State, became director of this office in September 2021. She is responsible for policy and programs to mitigate the impact of explosive hazards and reduce the threats that at risk illicitly proliferated and irresponsibly used conventional weapons pose to the international security and stability. Previously, Karen served as the director of the interagency manned portable air defense system known as MANPADS task force and as the chief of staff of the Bureau of Political Military Affairs. In her nearly two decades at the State Department, she has worked at provincial reconstruction team in Afghanistan, the counterterrorism bureau and as the deputy to the special representative to Muslim communities. We are so grateful to have her with us today to share her expertise as I believe she has in the past. Jasmine Dan, the operating manager of Halo Somalia works as the operations manager in Mogadishu, Somalia. Jasmine joined HALO in 2018 as policy and advocacy manager, and since then has worked for HALO in Sri Lanka in Eastern Ukraine. Prior to joining HALO, she worked for the government of Canada. She holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Ottawa and a master's in international affairs from the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs. Welcome to all of you, thank you for joining us for the presentation today. Tobias, would you like to lead us off? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I just wanna say, can you hear me? Double check that. Yes, we can. can. Hear me? Is that okay? I can hear you, yes. I'm assuming everyone else can as well. Great, okay. Well, thank you very much for having me today. This is a real pleasure, both as a member of HALO and as an American citizen, this is a great opportunity for me and I'm very, very happy to be here. So I'll be talking about the Horn of Africa, but specifically I'll be focusing on Somaliland. So we'll just give a general overview and talk about the context of our work in the region. Uh, next slide, please. So I just want to give a very special thank you to this caucus and several members of this caucus who have supported HALO in the past, who have come to our programs, including the co-chair herself, who came to Nagorno-Karabakh. And it is not without your support or your tireless efforts that we make the work possible that is, is so life-saving. And I just want to say thank you to everyone in the caucus and especially especially for all the congressional support you've had over many, many years. Thank you for myself and from everyone in HALO. Next slide. So in terms of the mine contamination within the region, it's important to look at several events in the past 60 years which have impacted and today still play an important role in why we're still clearing mines. The first of them is that 
the area that we consider to be Somalia and Somaliland, Ethiopia, historically was seen as one area called the Agadim. And this meant that people who are from Somalia or from Ethiopia culturally see themselves as part of a greater whole. And it is during the post period when Somalia became independent in 1960 that there was border clashes between Ethiopia and Somalia. This led to, in 1964, uh, an intense skirmish between Ethiopia, which led to mining along the borders that we see today. This was then exacerbated in 1977 and 1978 with a very bloody conflict known as the Ogden War, which involved both Cuba and Angolan troops due to Russian influence and US influence. Today, that is probably the most heavily uh, mine contaminated uh, presence. This is along the borders of Somaliland and Somalia itself. And the numbers, I mean, you couldn't put an exact figure, but is several thousand mines were laid both the smaller variety known as anti-personal mines and the larger anti-vehicle mines, which you alluded to in your opening remarks, are still doing horrible things to victims 50, 60 years past their intended um, operation. This is also important when we look at the 1980s as Somalia went into a civil war, which exacerbated skirmishes between clans. This led to sporadic mine laying. And then in 1991, when Somaliland became independent, this also led to certain clan disputes and sporadic mine laying. It wasn't until 1999 that HALO began its work in earnest, and this led to survey of contaminated areas and trying to do as much as possible to remove these deadly legacies of war. Next slide, please. As you said, this is actually a photo from that very same accident that you mentioned. You can see this is a school, a school bus, and it was driving. It was very close to the school itself. It could have happened to anyone, and it just shows the deadly legacy of war. There's been 265 civilian mine accidents in the last 10 years alone. This year, 2021, there was five different accidents all involving anti-vehicle mines. And of the most pressing concern is that over half of these, um, the victims are under 15 years old. And not only do mines impact lives, but they limit the access to education, to fresh water sources, to markets, which then exacerbates poverty in areas where it's already a great concern due to drought. Next slide, please. So how do we respond to these uh, deadly legacies? Well, we have many activities within HALO, but primarily we do manual mine clearance, which involves people going into mined areas in a safe uh, delineated pattern to remove these items. We also use larger assets such as the tractors you see here, but we also try to resolve this issue through mine risk education, teaching kids and adults where they're safe to go, uh, things to look out for, and how you should respond if you do see something that is either a mine or a stray mortar, rocket projectile, and who to talk to. We also make sure the proliferation of weapons does not exacerbate, and we try to do survey and weapons destruction. The other important factor that we have now partnered with different organizations is providing victim assistance. As you'll see in the corner, this is an organization that um, offers prosthetic legs to victims of mine accidents. Next slide, please. So what have we accomplished? Since 1999, due primarily to US funding, we have made over 80 kilometers of land safe within Somaliland. Um, given perspective, about four kilometers would be the size of Central Park. So we've essentially cleared 160 Central Parks in the last 20 years. We've also helped over 87,000 people. And this is not just the land we've made safe, but you could say another 100, 200,000 have been prospered due to land being cleared transit, safe access to water, or any number of assets that cleared land provides. We've also educated over half a million people on the risks of mines and UXO and how they can live their lives safely with these items until they can be cleared. Next slide, please. And we should also remember that mines do not just make people's lives unsafe or their livelihoods but they can also have far reaching consequences on the environment. By having mined areas and people know they cannot farm, they cannot move here, it creates a consolidation of resources because of land scarcity. 
This means that primarily pastoral farmers are forced to use the same land for grazing, which can then be overused, leading to desertification. Um, landmines can also impact the amount of access to education, or they can limit how we can um, find new markets, have new job opportunities. And by removing these mines, we help all of these factors and we can create a more prosperous community. We can create a more prosperous nation of smaller land. Next slide, please. And in addition to the work we do to clear mines, we have also in the last two years made a very concerted effort to help with COVID-19. We have an abundance of highly skilled, educated people and a very competent workforce. And we have used our resources, including our own vehicles as ambulances, distribution of vehicles, distribution of face masks and helping vaccine drives. This is just one of the many ways that we can help not just the country, but everyone who lives in it live a safer life. In addition to that, we've also started um, trying to emphasize conservation work so that the land we clear is not returned to desertification, but we can actually make it greener than when we cleared it. Uh, you see in this picture, these are soil buns that we have done through a partner, which is gonna do rain capture plus reseeding, which will hopefully make this area greener than we actually started. Next slide, please. And lastly, I wanna talk about the future. And you have both mentioned in your talks about Ethiopia. It is very unfortunate right now that the ongoing conflict has meant we cannot survey, we cannot start work or accreditation, um, but we still looking towards the future, see this as our next priority within the region. In this map, you can see the vast majority, over 92% of contamination in Ethiopia lies along the borders. So right now we are working on five separate tasks within this border, but we know that as soon as we have permission, we want to expand our resources, expand our team so we can continue to clear all the minefields within Ethiopia. And luckily in the next few years, we can also make Somaliland mine free, but it will depend on continued support and on continued, if we can have the same outputs that we do now but it is in no way a far-fetched fantasy anymore. A mine-free Somaliland, a mine-impact-free Somaliland is something that we can attain here and now. But I also wanna to touch on very quickly that this contamination with Ethiopia and Somaliland is also something that extends into the South. Next slide, please. And you will see that this contamination from the Ogden Wars or from different conflicts also extends uh, much in the same way through Somalia. So I'm going to finish now and hand it over to my colleague Jasmine, who will give you a context on the Somalia region. Thank you very much for your time and thank you for listening. Thank you, Toby. So as Toby has said, the mine contamination that we see in Somaliland continues right down across the border um, into Somalia itself right along the border with Ethiopia, dating from the same period of time from the Ogaden conflict. However, the context that we're operating in in Somalia is radically different to that up in Somaliland currently. Uh, well, in the north, Somaliland has enjoyed growing peace over the past decade. This has not been the case in the south. Civil war since the fall of the Siadbari regime, fighting between warlords, followed by the rise of extremist groups such as al-Shabaab, have met continued conflict and insecurity in the area. At present, the federal government controls the major cities in Somalia, but outside of this area, there's still large areas that are under al-Shabaab control. Additionally, clan conflict is something that is ever present in Somalia and continually affects our operations. Put together, this means that the level of contamination and the risk to civilian populations in Somalia is extensive. It also puts constraints on our own access. It means that we need to continuously analyze the changing security conditions in the country to ensure that our staff are safe, and also that we're meeting the most urgent humanitarian needs in the area. It does mean also, however, that our socioeconomic impact is extreme in Somalia. Most of the communities that we're working in have seen very few NGOs because the access to those areas is so limited. There are continued accidents that keep happening. Uh, we see both animal and human accidents happening throughout Somalia, although the full extent of these is not known. Um, additionally, mines are blocking access to medical centers, education, as well as travel routes for many of the nomadic populations that are moving across Somalia. Next slide, please. 
So what do we do in order to meet these threats? So similarly to what is happening in Somaliland, we also work in mine clearance, manual mine clearance only, um, as well as educating people of the risk that they face. However, we have a larger focus on weapons and ammunition disposal, as well as weapons and ammunition management, both of which are funded solely by the United States government. Next slide, please. State, we have been able to make 8.6 kilometers squared of land cleared in Somalia. That is from 2015 until uh, present day. This work has been able to help over 8,000 different people. And given the level of contamination, over 40,000 items have been destroyed across Somalia already. Through our risk education, we've also been able to assist over 80,000 people. The minefield shown in red on this map is the extent of contamination that we've been able to find in the country so far. We know that this is nowhere near the full extent of contamination, uh, but given the different constraints in the country, this is where we've been able to access to date. We expect to find similar levels of contamination to the south into Jubaland, as well as in the north up to Finland. In 2021, we've been able to expand our clearance quite significantly. To date, we've cleared 15 minefields in Somalia, nine of those completed this year alone, uh, which is something we hope to continue on into 2022. Next slide, please. However, what I would say is probably the biggest impact of HALO's work in Somalia right now is weapons and ammunition disposal. These US funded teams are able to respond to calls from community when they find an item uh, that they know is dangerous and that they don't know what to do with. The teams are then able to respond and destroy that item on the spot, removing that risk for communities. The photo that you see here shows the extent that some households have in their possession. In this one EOD call out, a family had over 350 projectiles and mortars which Halo was able to dig up from their garden and dispose of. In November 2021 alone, the teams funded by the United States have destroyed 842 items across Somalia. This includes rockets, projectiles, grenades, and mortars. In addition, because these teams are flexible and mobile, they're able to navigate the challenging security conditions and go wherever the need is most. We saw this most recently after the fighting in Guriel. In October 2021, we saw renewed conflict between a moderate Islamist group, Al Sunnah Wal Jamaa, as well as the federal government. Fighting in this area caused over 18,000 people to flee from their homes. However, as soon as the violence was finished, Halo's teams were able to enter the area. Immediately in the two weeks following, we destroyed 30 items, which presented an immediate hazard to populations and delivered risk education to 250 people. However, on November 12th, despite these activities, an accident took place. In this accident, three children, aged 16, 14, and two, were killed in their own home. The children had found a rocket propelled grenade in the community and brought it home, not knowing the danger that it posed. These kind of incidents show the importance of our work and the importance of US funding in order to dispose of these items safely. Next slide, please. Additionally, the amount of weapons in circulation in Somalia is extensive. It's estimated that there are over 1 million weapons currently in circulation in the country, equating to approximately one in every 13 Somalis. The photo that you see in the top right here is also from Guriel, that's our operations manager, Hassan Kosar, um, showing the availability of weapons uh, for anyone who wants to be able to possess them. These weapons enter and flow through the country through a number of ways. Um, internally, we see deliberate leakage or sale of state weapons. Uh, as well as through the capture of security force facilities. Externally, these are able to enter the country through illegal imports by non-state armed groups, such as Al-Shabaab, which arrive along Somalia's long coastline from countries such as Afghanistan or Yemen. Our work in securing these weapons and ammunition helps prevent their diversion through theft or sale, uh, which further fuels conflict in the area. It also prevents explosive hazarding, which as we know, can then be used to further Al-Shabaab's aims and make IEDs. Additionally, making sure that these things are stored safely means we can prevent unplanned explosions, causing harm to nearby civilians. To date, we have been able to refurbish or construct 44 armories across the country and trained over 250 storekeepers in safe practices. Additionally, 50 risk assessments have been conducted in 2021, which will lead to further actions in the new year. Next slide, please. All of this goes to show the importance of US leadership and support um, in making safe Somalia and Somaliland. Thanks to the support of the United States government, we've been able to make safe over 400 communities across Somalia. In doing so, we've destroyed 25,000 items, helped over 100,000 people, as well as the activities I've just mentioned in weapons and ammunition management, and making safe almost 80 kilometers of land across the country. 
We greatly appreciate the continued support from the United States government, which continues to be the world's leading supporter of demining efforts. And we hope to see continued strong congressional support for these efforts to enhance safety and security in the region going forward. I wanna thank you very much for your time. Um, and I will now hand it over to the next panelist. Thank you. Okay, we will next hear from Karen Chandler, the director um, for the Office of Weapons Removal and Abatement, um, Bureau of Political and Military Affairs at the US Department of State. Karen, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Karen Chandler and I'm the director of the Office of Weapons Removal and Abatement for the State Department's Bureau of Political and Military Affairs. I'm very honored to participate in today's UXO caucus event. I would like to first thank Representative Jackie Spear and Representative Bill Johnson for their continued leadership of the Congressional UXO Caucus, as well as Representative Omar for participating today. I also want to acknowledge HALO for their continuing role in coordinating these events. The Department of State takes great pride in leading US efforts across the globe to advance conventional weapons destruction priorities which include clearing landmines, unexploded ordnance, and other explosive hazards, as well as bolstering the capacity of our international partners to manage their arms and ammunition stockpiles safely and securely. These essential humanitarian efforts are made possible by the generosity of the American people and broad bipartisan support in Congress. Today, I would like to highlight our ongoing efforts in the Horn of Africa and underscore how providing conventional weapons destruction assistance to our partners can promote regional stability and counter the influence of malign actors. The United States has long been the world's largest international donor to conventional weapons destruction, investing more than $4 billion to support safely clearing landmines and unexploded ordnance, as well as helping to secure and safely dispose of at-risk conventional arms and munitions in more than 100 countries since 1993. In Africa alone, the United States has provided more than $509 million in conventional weapons destruction assistance since 1993. Throughout the region, this effort helps curb pilferage and illicit trafficking of small arms and light weapons from state-held stockpiles, including weapons of particular concern like manned portable air defense systems or man pads. This programming makes it harder for terrorists, human traffickers, and criminal gangs to get the weapons and ammunition they need to continue terrorizing local populations and undermining the rule of law. Our work promotes regional stability and economic development, protects US interests abroad, and reduces the risk of catastrophic unplanned explosions at munitions storage sites, such as the March 2021 blast in Bata, Equatorial Guinea, that killed an estimated 107 people and wounded an additional 613 civilians. In the Horn of Africa and elsewhere in the continent, traffickers, criminal gangs, and violent extremist organizations such as Al-Shabaab use illegally obtained small arms and light weapons to advance a culture of violence and fear that threatens civilian security and contributes to the root cause of instability. According to the University of Maryland, six of the 10 countries experiencing the most deaths by terrorism in 2019 lie within Africa, making this work even more important. Responsible stockpile management practices reduce the number of illicit weapons available throughout the region and disrupt terrorist activities contributing to instability. Conflicts in the Horn of Africa continue to threaten regional stability. Increasing violence in Ethiopia and Somalia contribute to the risk of illicit diversion of small arms and light weapons, while making growing numbers of civilians vulnerable to injury or death from mines and unexploded ordnance. These conflicts contribute to driving forced displacement and increasing regional instability. In Ethiopia, the United States already has contributed more than $600 million in humanitarian aid to alleviate suffering from the conflict and we are looking for opportunities to do more, although the dynamic nature of ongoing fighting and the very real dangers faced by aid workers limit our options. We also remain the leading international donor for physical security and stockpile management and weapons and ammunition destruction efforts in the Horn of Africa. Recently, the region has seen increasingly sophisticated attacks from violent extremist organizations 
including the January 2020 attack at Munda Bay. These complex attacks often target remote outposts with vulnerable stockpiles of small arms and light weapons, which are then used to re-equip and resupply violent extremist organizations. The illicit seizure of state-held stockpiles also fuels regional instability as transnational smuggling and trafficking routes out of Somalia are increasingly utilized to fuel fighting in countries such as Yemen. While much remains to be achieved, our most successful ongoing engagement in the region is in Somalia, where our partners are conducting programs to curb the illicit flow of small arms and light weapons, including shoulder-fired missiles, and to remedi remediate the risk of unexploded ordnance and other explosive hazards to local populations and prevent illicit groups from retrieving and utilizing these hazards for nefarious purposes. The Department of State aims to expand programming in FY22 to include monitoring of illicit arms markets and programs to mark and trace small arms and light weapons divested to partner forces by the US Department of Defense. Our implementing partners in the Horn of Africa, like HALO and MAG, have worked to find innovative ways to assess and address the threat that vulnerable small arms and light weapons pose to the region. In 2020 and 2021 alone, despite the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, U.S.-funded efforts have resulted in the construction of 18 secure structures to safely store small arms and light weapons and in the destruction of more than 2,875 items. Despite the pandemic, U.S.-funded efforts also trained over 100 Somali security personnel in physical security and stockpile management and explosive ordnance disposal. Additionally, we have seen the introduction of data-based assessments which increase collaboration amongst donors and provide information that can inform current and future US conventional weapons destruction priorities. In conclusion, the US commitment to conventional weapons destructions in the Horn of Africa continues to grow. Our commitment is grounded in over 25 years of bipartisan congressional and taxpayer support, combined with the experience and determination of our implementing partners. Together, we have worked with host governments as well as communities at the local level to create a resilient program that has evolved and adapted along with the threat from landmines, unexploded ordnance, small arms and light weapons, and related munitions. The American taxpayer can be proud of the assistance rendered to this part of the world. Thank you. Okay. So thank you so much to Karen Chandler for informing us on how state is able to assist the programs that we heard about from Tobias and Jasmine. Thank you so much for providing these updates. You guys are involved in incredibly important work as we heard. And thank you also to HALO for helping us organize today's briefing. Um, and thank you to everyone who was able to attend. For any congressional staff, if your boss is interested in joining the congressional um, caucus, please feel free to reach out to me or to Kate Adams with um, Congresswoman Spears' office. So um, Congresswoman Spears, did, did you have anything else you wanted to, to share? I see you're jumping back on. Been on, but I've been moving. So I hate, hate it when people are moving and, and keep their, their um, pictures on. Uh, are there any questions that any of those who are on the call would like to ask? Looks like we're about to have a vote. Um, if there are none, then uh, again, I wanna thank our panelists. Uh, a special thank you to Karen Chandler who um, has, has done some um, briefings for us before and who is um, our go-to person. Thank you. And, and thank you to um, the representatives from HALO who are on as well. Um, and with that, I guess we will conclude our program. <laughs>